Hello everybody and welcome back to um, Prehistoric Kingdom Speculation. So uh, yeah, today we're going to be covering the Paleozoic Era. And um, yeah, let's get straight into it. Yeah, so for those who don't know, the Paleozoic Era was um, the era before the Mesozoic, which was the time of dinosaurs. This is where life started to evolve. So going from invertebrates to fish to amphibians to reptiles and to mammal-like ancestors. And um, so we're starting with the Cambrian. Now the Cambrian um, is the one where life really started to proliferate and had the most suitable species for a game like Prehistoric Kingdom. My first species is Anomalocaris. Now Anomalocaris was an apex predator, one of the largest arthropods of all time, games were about 2 meters long and was the largest animal in the Cambrian seas. Opabinia is another specialized arthropod predator with a prehensile proboscis with a claw at the end for snaring prey and five eyes on stalks. Very weird predator indeed. Um, Pekaya was a primitive chordate or vertebrate with an eel-like body, small head and several small legs towards the head. Um, much like an eel, it was swum in a sort of S-like slithering fashion. And Red Leachia is an Australian species of trilobite, growing to 30 centimetres long, making it one of the bigger trilobites of the Cambrian. And um, yeah, trilobites are just that iconic that we need at least one. Now moving to the next period, the Ordovician. Um, this might sound familiar to those um, hardcore Nigel Marvin fans out there. Um, Teraspis was an ancient jawless fish defined by its nasal horn and spur that would one day become the fin's dorsal fin. The, the fish's dorsal fins. The fin's dorsal fins? What? The fish's dorsal fins. Um, Megalograptus is a species of Eurypterid or sea scorpion that grew to about 75 centimeters. This particular species gave Nigel some trouble on his trip to the Ordovician. Reference. And Camaroceros, or the giant orthocone, was an ancient cephalopod that ruled as the apex predator of its time. It is estimated to have grown to about 9 meters long, which is as long as a beach volleyball net, or the largest green anaconda. Now moving to the Silurian, you can see um, Teraspis there. Um, many species from the Ordovician did manage to um, like cross over to the Silurian as well. Um, Terrygotus was one of the largest Eurypterids, far larger than Megalograptus, growing to a whole metre longer. It was still, however, dwarfed by other species of Eurypterid of the Eurypterid group, such as Jackalopterus and Echuteramus, which surpassed 2 metres, with the former getting to 2.6. Um, Guiyu is one of the earliest known bony fish from China. The holotype is estimated at 26 centimetres which is similar to a modern blue tang. Or, for those Disney fans out there, basically the um, fish that was portrayed by Dory. Yeah, it would be interesting to get this um, rather interesting little fish. Now we start to get into where life really starts to proliferate. Um, the Devonian. Yeah, this, this probably has one of the largest collections of animals that I put on this list. Um, so Cephalaspis was an ancient species of bony fish about the size of a trout which used its jawless mouth to feed on invertebrates and algae in the water. Um, this is a species that many people might know from Walking with Monsters. Um, if you don't know Walking with Monsters I do suggest you go check it out, it's a really good series. Um, Dunkleosteus, fan favourite of sea monsters. Dunkleosteus was around 8 meters long, the largest placoderm of all time, or bony armored fish. Its notable jaws have extensions of the jawbone which help this huge predator bite through armored food, food, food even its own kind. 
Wow. Um, Hunterpton is one of the earliest amphibians, taking some of the first vertebrate steps onto land, resembling a giant salamander and reaching two meters long. Um, Hyneria was one of the largest lobe-finned fish of all time, and one of the largest freshwater fish too. Um, yeah, it was a it was a huge predator. It walked with monsters. Um, it was seen to have used its um, unique fins to sort of work its way up the beach to catch a Hynerpeton. Um, whether that's still accurate to Hyneria, I don't know. I probably should have done a little bit more research into it. But hey, what can you do? Um, Blotheria lepus was a widespread genus of placoderms or armored fish and was also very abundant, making it a prime food source for many Devonian predators, such as Dunkleosteus. Antictalic was a very bizarre species, being an ancient species of lobe and fish that represented the transition from fish to the ev next evolutionary landmark, amphibians, vertebrates that could live both in water and land. I, for a while, thought it was a, an amphibian, but I guess it's an intermediate species. Um, Plateau Sea Lake is one of the earliest representations of sharks and often referred to as the earliest shark. It somewhat resembled the body shape of the modern mackerel sharks, such as Great Whites and Makos. Um, Eustonoptera <laughs> um, is a meter long lobe fin fish, much like Hyneria. However, unlike most of its um, kind, this species is often thought of as a close relative of the first tetrapods four-footed vertebrates that took the first steps on land 20 million years after Eustonopteron's extinction. Um, Ichthyostega was an amphibian from the end of the Devonian that was one of the first amphibians to emerge onto land. It was one of the first vertebrates to have the weight-bearing adaptations to support land movement. Yeah, and for those who've played Jurassic World the game, you'll know Ichthyostega. Doesn't look like the one in the picture though. <laughs> Looks very different. Now moving on to the Carboniferous. Um, one of my personal favourite periods in time. Giant insects. Let's get into it. So, first giant insect is Meganeura. So, Meganeura was a giant dragonfly that flew the Carboniferous skies with prowess and supremacy. Without anything to really challenge them, they were the airborne equivalent of the amphibians and predatory arthropods on the ground. An apex predator. Um, Arthropleura was a giant relative of modern millipedes, millipedes, but of course much larger. Nigel for one was even intimidated by this giant invertebrate. It is often estimated to be 2.6 meters, similar to the largest eurypterids, being as long as a small car. And um, also herbivorous, even though it might seem like it would be a fearsome predator, um, Arthropleura would have used its large mandibles to feed on vegetation, as many paleontologists theorize. Um, Crassodurinus is another one of Nigel's favorites. Um, this amphibian was mostly aquatic and from the United Kingdom. Um, as Nigel said in Prehistoric Park, um, it got the name Crassodurinus scoticus, which is because it was found in Scotland. Um, with its large jaws, this powerful predator could have been a potential threat to others of its own kind and ma many of the giant insects that could come too close to the water. Looking at that set of gnashes, yeah, I wouldn't want to be one of the unlucky um, young Arthropleura or young amphibians in that swamp. Um, Proterogerinus was one of the largest amphibians uh, of the Carboniferous, bigger than Crassogerinus and would have been Meganeura's equivalent. The apex predator of the semi-aquatic environment. Definitely. Being the size of a crocodile really gets you somewhere. Um, Pomo Scorpius was one of the largest scorpions, being around 70 centimeters in length. Nigel got on the wrong end of this one, although does the scorpion really have a wrong end? Um, like one wrong end. Both you get in pain. Either one you get stung, or two you get pinched. Um, like modern scorpions, it is thought to have had an invertebrate killing venom, but could it have been fatal to, fatal, fatal to vertebrates too? Um, yeah, we may never know that, but um, it could. 
considering many small scorpions today um, have been known to kill people. So, uh, yeah. Maybe don't test your luck if you... If we would have resurrect Palmon and Scorpius. Certainly wouldn't want to be on the end of that sting. Um, Stathocanthus was a widespread relative of sharks, defined by its ironing board dorsal fin, which gives it its nickname, the ironing board shark. Uh, Stathocanthus ranged in various sizes, with one species estimated at 1.5 meters, and others reaching three. Um, many paleontologists theorize that uh, the bizarre dorsal fin could have been um, used for either mating displays or courtship or um, any other displays um, in the face of um, like the reproductive cycle having to compete um, for mates. And now we come to the longest chapter um, of the video. The Permian and Early Triassic. I combine these two because they both have very similar species and are named together as you have a Permian Triassic extinction that wiped out 90% of all living animals on the planet. First of all is Dimetrodon, perhaps the most famous animal of the Permian and of the Paleozoic as a whole, with a signature sail that defines other sailback synapses such as the Daphosaurus and Secodontosaurus. This powerful predator was probably the apex predator of his region until larger predators evolved a few million years later, such as the Gorgonopsids and the Therocephalians. The Daphosaurus was a herbivorous synapsid, unlike its carnivorous Dimetrodon relative. They were very successful animals that would make a great addition for the diversity in the synapsids, particularly the sailback variety. Um, Platyhistrix was a sailback amphibian adorning the aforementioned sail, very similar to that of the unrelated synapsids, Dimetrodon, Secodontosaurus, and Adaphosaurus. Um, you, you guys might know this species from Path of Titans, like the image I have here. Um, and it would be nice to see some of the lesser known creatures represented more widely in uh, dinosaur media, and um, like prehistoric um, media as a whole. I, I would love to see this guy in more stuff. Like, he's, he's a very bizarre little amphibian. Inostrancevia, probably one of my favorites of the Paleozoic, because it's it's really cool. Like, look at it. It's an absolute beast. So, um, Inostrancevia was a large carnivorous Gorgonopsid, a family of therapsids from the late Permian, and dominated as the apex predator of much of the Laurasia part of Pangaea. It particularly favored the taste of Scutosaurus. Walk with dinosaurs easter egg. <laughs> Walking Dark, no, Walking with Monsters Easter Egg, damn it. Um, speaking of Scutosaurus, um, this relative of turtles um, was a large paraeosaur covered from head to tail with bony nodules or scutes, which help protect it from predators such as Inostrancevia, and these scutes give this animal its name. Um, Staminosuchus was a bizarre therapsid, which is thought to have been omnivorous, feeding on plant growth and meat. Its strange horns are often theorized to be an early representation of intraspecies display. Intraspecies being um, within the same species. Interspecies is between different species. Just a little tip for you guys there. Um, Cotolorhynchus was a bizarre reptile still in the therapsid family, but with some really odd proportions from the size of its head in comparison to its body and limbs. Yeah. Almost reminds me of Dewback from Star Wars. Um, anyway, it was a large herbivore growing to about 6 meters long, which is as long as the largest saltwater crocodiles. So, um, yeah, imagine this, this hench lizard just walking up to you. Well, I mean, it's not exactly a lizard, but um, it is a reptile. Uh, Moss Chops was another one of the Permian's bizarre therapsids, which, which is notable for its small sloped head. It is thought that his blunt, sheep-like head would have been used for headbutting in intraspecies fights. I got used to saying intraspecies. <laughs> um, Silurus aravis was a basal diapsid, a group that includes today's modern reptiles, such as crocodilians, uh, tuataras, lizards, turtles, tortoises, and snakes. Um, this particular species is known from Madagascar, which had 
which was discovered with rod-like bones projected outwards, which has led many paleontologists to suggest that this species possessed wings supported by a thin layer of membrane between these rods, which could have allowed it to glide or fly, much like today's Draco or flying dragon. Um, Ariops was a large Temnus bundle amphibian from the Texas Red Beds. Funny enough, for those who have played Jurassic World Evolution 2, that is where you'll find um, Dimetrodon. Um, and the same formation, occupied by Dimetrodon, could have possibly led to conflict between um, this large amphibian um, and Dimetrodon whenever it came down to drink. Who knows? Two apex predators of two different worlds. Cryonosuchus was a large amphibian from early Permian Brazil. It is thought to have grown to the size of what it most resembles, crocodilians known as gharials, which get to around 5 meters, and um, perhaps with its mostly aquatic lifestyle, it would have acted much like gharials too. Though being an amphibian, it probably wouldn't have been able to walk very well, so like gharials, they would slide their bodies along the surface of the ground into the water. Um, Secodontosaurus, much like Adaptosaurus and Dimetrodon, is distinct with sail back. However, this particular species is um, distinctive with its crocodilian-esque snout. Um, Diadectus, you know, this one looks more like a dewback actually. Um, so this was another herbivorous synapsid, much like Cotylorhynchus, but a bit smaller at about 3 meters, with Cotylorhynchus being 6. I, I just wanted to diversify the synapsids because they were the dominant um, life on Earth for several million years until the dinosaurs evolved. So having many different species in a game like Prehistoric Kingdom would be fantastic. Um, Helicoprion is one of the most uniquely depicted prehistoric sharks, often shown with a buzzsaw lower jaw, which could have um, allowed it to cut prey right in half. This species was larger than great white sharks today, esti estimated up to 7 plus meters. Yeah, that's a big predatory shark. Um, yeah, <laughs> that, is, that would be a terrifying thing to see, just a shark swim along, there's a little fish snip. Right in half. Um, Diplocolis is an iconic species of ancient amphibian, uh, distinct with its boomerang head. This species is estimated at about a meter, by far not the largest, but certainly one of the most am uh, I was about to say amphamous, amphi <laughs> one of the most famous amphibians of the Permian. Um, Diarctodon was a small synapsid that is suspected to have lived in burrows in the overheated landscape above the ground. For those who don't know, Pangaea was dominated by a vast desert um, for much of the end of the Permian era, which um, was su subject to lots of climate change that led to the mass um, Permian-Triassic extinction. Um, these little fellows were surrounded by large owls like Scutosaurus and Ionis Transavia, and it is probably the best um, adapted to this desert lifestyle by living underground, taking advantage of the shelter where it could. And um, for this ancestor of Lystrosaurus, to stay where no one can catch you was probably a good idea. Um, Eucambersia was a species of Therosophalian, a type of therapsid similar to Gorgonopsids. Um, this one, however, um, and many Therosophalians are suspected to have had a venomous bite, which is something you don't find often outside of snakes. So, um, yeah, that would make it interesting if it were to escape from its enclosure and go after a dinosaur or something. Uh, speaking of Lystrosaurus from earlier, um, it was one of the most successful species amid the Permian Triassic extinction, being a very popular species. With distinct tusks and a bony head, um, many specimens found all over the world from Antarctica, Asia, and Africa all matched Lystrosaurus. Um, yeah, so this is probably one of the best animals to recover um, after that major extinction. And they certainly didn't waste any time. 
Um, Protorosuchus is an extinct species of archosaurus form, a species that lived in the early Triassic that was one of the apex predators of the rivers of Pangaea. They may look like crocodiles, but their long legs, long neck, and distinct hook snout. Um, you don't really find that in crocodiles today. Um, Euparcaria was a revolutionary archosaurus form. It is thought to have been close in ancestry to the archosaurs. The reptile group that includes crocodilians, birds, pterosaurs, and of course, the dinosaurs. The ending of Orchid Monsters really um, dramatized it. Um, Deer Park area at the very end. One of the most memorable endings to any documentary I've ever seen. Yeah, so um, if you enjoyed that video um, and would like to see more, like and subscribe um, down below. Um, click the notification bell if you want um, to get any further news on Prehistoric Kingdom um, that I'll cover. When um, the next update releases with Paraceratherium, I will be doing a little showcase video um, for that animal. And um, yeah, next up is the Mesozoic, so um, hold on to your seats. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to doing a bit more speculation on Prehistoric, um, prehistoric Planet, Prehistoric Kingdom. And, um, yeah, it's going to be really interesting, um, in the future of this game. So, uh, yeah, see you later.